Today's guest is John Spira. He's a filmmaker and ex-video shop owner, which I'm very excited about, <laughs> and an all-round digger of things that tend to exist on your peripheral vision, or at least that's how I see you. Yeah, that's how I see myself too. Cool. I don't know where to start. It's There's so much to talk about. So I'll start most recently, and let's talk about Hollywood Bulldogs. Sure. A film about stuntmen, I guess, and women. Sadly, not women, because none of them would, would, would be interviewed by us. We really tried hard to get some interviews with some of the, the women of that generation, um, and, and they really they really didn't want to do it. So it was a bit of a shame that, that we, we were in, we did end up with, with all guys. But, you know, that's what happened. <laughs> did they exist in great numbers? stunt women yeah yeah it was pretty it was pretty proportional and and in fact there's a midway through the film there's a little montage um of the original stunt directory which was where they all uh the first midway through the film they kind of um our team of stunt guys kind of unionize effectively and kind of create this uh this uh i mean essentially it's like a club you know a professional organization yeah. which they're members of and they put out this stunt directory which ha- which was like the kind of spotlight actors books and it would come with photos of each of them and tell you what all their skills were and we made this montage and it's i mean i think there were a good kind of 20 or 30 women in that original one out of probably 100 kind of people so it was actually quite representational they, i mean because it was needed they 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 needed women to be able to do stunts. It was, um, and back when when stunting kind of really began properly, there was no such thing as a stunt performer anyway. So, if they wanted a woman to f- fall down a flight of stairs, there were no professional stuntmen to dress up. They would literally just find a woman and say, "We'll give you a tenner extra if you're prepared to fall down a flight of stairs." So they did it. Done. You know, one of our guys in the film, Rocky, his mum. We, we mentioned it in the film. We actually found the clip incredibly as well from a film from 1953 where his mum was hired to be pushed down a flight of stairs on a wheelchair. Well, that's quite a good stunt <laughs> anyway, regardless. It's a great, it's a great stunt. And she was happy. She was, she's still alive. He got her on the phone while we were interviewing him. Brilliant. She's like nine, 96 or something. <laughs> and she got paid, she got paid 300 quid each time they pushed her down the stairs in 1953. So it's a lot of money. Yeah, that's a good few grand, right? <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of money back then. Wow. <laughs> My, I'll throw this story in anyway. Um, back, back when I was a kid, uh, being a stuntman was the first thing I ever wanted to be. I think I'd been to see Hooper at the cinema. Lovely. And the the total glamour of, well, Burt Reynolds made anything glamorous back then. The total glamour of what they were doing was just, just caught me really good. Um, when I announced it to my careers officer a few years later, I was met with uh, brick walls of silence and shaking heads, <laughs> as were probably most stuntmen who announced it in such a way. And um, then, then of course, I said I wanted to be Alice Cooper, and that didn't work either, but, uh, <laughs> but that's a whole different ball game. But, um, <laughs> Being a stuntman is, did, did you find it was something everyone fell into? Or, or did, I seem to get the drift that they generally went in search of hard men who could take the knocks. And yeah. that actually made the stuntman industry rather than the other way around. Would that be fair? Yeah, yeah I think that's pretty much it. They certainly, everyone we interviewed there was no such thing as a stuntman before they they did the job. So none of them had it as a career ambition at all. And yeah, they all came into it in different ways. And that's kind of the interesting thing is that to be a stunt performer, you actually have to be able to, to do a lot of different disciplines. You know, it's a lot of different things. And they all came into it from their own places really so you had someone like Vic who was a professional horse rider so that's how he came into it he came into it on the horses but because he was hanging out with the other kind of stunties at the time they were saying well you know can you can you shimmy down a rope and can you can you jump into water and stuff so so you know he, he diversified someone like Jim he came into it because he'd been in the army there's a big tradition in stunts of of especially from the earliest stunt performers they were all in World War II 
So they had been demobbed. They didn't have any work. They were working as film extras. So when people were offering money to do stuff like get thrown through windows, they'd all done that in the war. They'd, they'd, they'd done that kind of thing. They knew how their bodies worked. So they did that. So Jim, who came into it in the 60s, he, he had been in the army and he was an armorer on film sets. So he was used to shooting guns and that kind of thing. So that's how he came into it. Uh, you had other people who came into it through kind of sporting, different kind of sport disciplines, different gymnastic type things. Rocky was a was professional um, judo wrestler. Handy. So that exactly but and also a lot of them came into it through their families i mean like that original bunch of kind of of kind of unprofessional stunt performers who were all hard men they were all kind of bouncers and kind of mobsters and you know criminals and, and guys like that and they they got into film they were real working class guys yet they were mingling with film stars who respected them for what they did so their kids quite naturally were like well i want to do what my dad does you know and they they were on the film sets when i was young someone like greg powell who's now you know he he was in charge of all the stunts on the harry potter films on lord of the rings he did it because his dad was nosha powell who, who was a legendary boxer and kind of entertainer who used to just take punches in films you can see Nosha in so many, but now, now Greg's pointed it out. Once you know what Nosha looks like, if you watch right. any British film from the 60s, the second he walks into the room, you know, there's going to be some kind of fight because that's what he was there for. So, yeah, they, they all kind of came into it in different ways. And it's changed now. It's a real profession now, you know. And, and like you say, you can at school say, I want to be a stunt performer. And there's actually a really good route into it. You know, if you want to do that, you can do that. There's, you know, you have to do a certain amount of training and qualify, but you can. Is there an age cap on it? <laughs> I don't know. You could give it a shot. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe 53 is pushing the boundaries a bit. Well, you know what? Our guys are still, a lot of our guys are still doing it. They're in their 70s and they're still doing it professionally. And in fact, Frank Henson, who died while we were making the film, who's a lovely guy, he was in his 80s and he was still working stunts up until right when he died. He was in, he's in the latest Pokemon film, which only came out a year ago. Yeah. So, you know, you, there's still work. And like I say, because they're all kind of related and they're all families and they all know each other, if they know that one of the old timers wants to do a job, they'll give him a job. You know, it's fine. Just text me. Exactly. Brilliant. <laughs> I mean, how, how, what, what's your story with this? Why do... Why did you decide to make it? I know you were, I know your work is very on the peripheries. Like if you like, you like dig into the brilliant things that you never think are brilliant until you have them put in front of you. So how yeah. did so how did you come to this? Just the chain of events. Well, yeah, I mean, there's a little chain of events. I mean, like you say, I'm always on the lookout for this this kind of thing, um, and I'm always interested uh, in. What, I'm interested in pop culture. I'm interested in what's happening two steps to the left of pop pop culture, basically. Which is the better way to be. And, well, it's just a more interesting way to be. I just get really bored. I, you know, I've always I've always watched a lot of documentaries, and when I got to a certain point when I was about thirty, I just felt like fucking hell. I've just you know every music documentary is exactly the same. It's exactly the same. It's a chronological thing, and it's a bunch of ne'er do wells who get together, working class lads against the odds. They make music, which is amazing. They become incredibly rich, incredibly successful. They argue and fall apart, and then in the nineties they reform, and that's the end of the film. And I had seen this film over and over and over and over and over again. And the thing that was driving me insane was that I've grown up around musicians, and at that point in my life most of my friends are musicians who are in bands, really good bands, and none of them were getting famous. And I'm looking around going, well, these guys are fucking brilliant, and I know they're brilliant, and they're not getting famous. So what's going on in these documentaries? Like, it just seems like it's an absolute lie. And when you talk to people who are in and around the music industry, especially bands, they will be the first to tell you that music is not a meritocracy in any way, shape, or form. The cream does not rise that you have to be at a certain level of ability, but once you get to that level of, of, of being able to make music, it's absolute luck, the ones who get huge and famous and the ones who get successful and once you get careers, and they will all, any band, any huge successful band, if you sit them down, 
they will tell you of a band who inspired them who never got out of their hometown. They will tell you of bands that they love who no one knows, you know, who maybe are still making music, but no one knows who they are. And that's what I wanted to do. So, so my first documentary was, was about my hometown, it was about Oxford, and it's about the music scene in Oxford. It's called Anyone Can Play Guitar. And I wanted to make it originally. I'd never made a documentary in my life. I, I was trained at film school, I made films, but I, and I'd given up pretty much at that point. But they were closing down the big venue in our city. They were closing down the Zodiac and they were reopening it as an O2 Academy. And we didn't have any corporate venues in Oxford at that time. And it was really upsetting because the music scene in Oxford is amazing. And it's a boot camp. You can work your way up. And Oxford has put all these amazing bands into the world. They've put out famous ones, a Radiohead, Foles, Swerve Driver, Ride, Young Knives, uh, to do the gosh, they've got Glass Animals are out there now. Huge bands who are not just big, but are um, influential bands. They tend to start their own genres. They, you know, they're really incredible. Yeah. And there was no... I found one article written about the Oxford music scene, which was written when Oxford was BBC Sound City in 97. That's all I found, written by Stuart Lee. And there had been nothing out there which was saying the reason that Oxford... Firstly, all these bands come from Oxford. Oh, Supergrass as well. I forgot Supergrass. And no one had made the connection that all these bands were from Oxford at all. Everyone's talking about the Manchester music scene. Everyone's talking about, you know, Bristol. No one's talking about Oxford's music scene. But these incredible bands have all come out of it over a 30-year period. And it's not a coincidence. It's because Oxford is like a boot camp. You work your way up through the venues... And it's an incredibly supportive scene, which is symbiotic between the crowds and the bands. There's nothing like it in the world. There's never been anything like it in the world. So when they were closing down our big venue, we were very scared that it was going to kill the ecosystem because that was the biggest venue. So if you take that out of the equation, then those bands aren't ready to go out into the world. Like, you know, the reason that Radiohead was ready to sign a big record contract when they were is because they'd progressed to the Oxford music scene and they were headlining at Zodiac. So you take Zodiac out of the equation, everyone's worried. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to make a documentary about this. This is going to be me making a documentary. And I spent about seven years doing this. It was a completely crazy project. I had no funding. I barely had a crew. I maybe did it myself. And at one point, it was going to be a film about the corporatization of music. And at one point, it was going to be a history of the Oxford Music Sync. So I interviewed so many people for this film. And then when I actually started editing it, I realized that the story that I want, what I wanted to do is tell the story of the Oxford scene. But the point that I wanted to make was what I hated about all these other music docs. And I wanted to show that for every Radiohead, there was a candy skins. You know, for every Supergrass, there was a 530. And for every band that had made it huge, there was a band that was as good as them who could have made it and didn't. And I gave equal time to those other bands. And that's the film, you know, and, and, and it made it, well, it gave me a career basically because people hadn't really done that before, you know? Yeah. And, and for me, like the most moving stuff in that film is when Radiohead talk about their friends who didn't make it, you know? And in fact, the film even healed bridges. The Radiohead, Ed Colin from Radiohead was, was texting me when he was watching the film that he was going to make friends again with the candy skins, you know, and they made friends again. They went out again and stuff, yeah. you know, because these are guys who had influenced them. And um, <laughs> so that kind of set up what I do now. My, did you, my did you go to, to film this. school? Yeah, I did. I went, I went to Scottish film school in, in Edinburgh in the, uh, in the mid nineties. Um, but I wasn't not for documentary and I didn't do documentary at film school. I mean, it's a terrible film school to be honest. <laughs> so, you know, it's didn't, it didn't really happen, but, um, that's sort of my approach to everything. Like my, my approach now is I love pop culture and I'm always going to want to make stuff about pop culture. Um, but I'm far more interested in what's going on at the side and you can keep what's going on in, in, in the kind of mainstream in the film. Like that's still always going to be a part of it, but it's so much more interesting. Like the stories are more interesting. The they people are, I are agree. More interesting. It's, and you know, the other thing is, I mean, I, I worked for the BFI for, for a chunk of years, like into, as their kind of main, as their in-house documentary maker and, and the kind of an interviewer, you know, like when famous people came through the, the BFI in South Bank, I'd be the one who kind of interviewed them on camera. And um, they're less interesting. Like people who are famous know how to be interviewed. <laughs> Yeah, they know how to be interviewed. And they've told the same story over and over and over again, and, and they will honest, take they will take your question and 
in a split second formulate the answer they want to give you rather than exactly. rather than the one you want which is the truth <laughs> exactly and also you know they've learned how to keep their true selves very private mm. so to be honest interviewing those kind of people as fun as it is to be like oh i'm in a room with benedict cumberbatch you know yeah. as fun as that is it's not you don't get great material whereas if you interview people who actually aren't used to being interviewed and you you treat them with great respect and you give them time and you listen to them and you let them talk, you get humanity. You get, you know, there's so much more kind of pathos and so much more empathy through doing that. Yeah. And um, and that's what interests me. That's 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 what interests me. Nice segue here. One of the guys that I find is very real still is uh, Neil Gaiman. I find he's oh, very, yeah. he, he, he sort of is on that cusp of, um, giving you what you want and saying what he needs to, but he's very free with his time. He'll sit with you forever. He has to be dragged away. Um, but that leads me into your Gothic. Um, is it a movie? It's a collection of mini movies, I guess. Gothic. Oh, the, the thing the, from the BFI, from the Gothic season. Yeah. 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 That was cool. That was, well, that was, so, so my job at the BFI was, um, was to make documentaries basically which would go online because um because the BFI is partly public funded they couldn't be completely London centric so if they were doing a season there would also have to be a lot of stuff that could go online so my department we would um we would produce original documentaries which was my job mainly I got promoted by the end of it and the other thing we did was we filmed all of the in-house stuff that happened on stage so that we could put that on YouTube as well. Right. So the idea was that for free, if the BFI was doing a season for free, anyone in the world could actually join in and, and kind of be a part of it. So when I first got there, my first job was the Gothic season, which was a huge, it was their first super season. And yeah, it was making documentaries, which kind of complemented that, which kind of, um, which kind of brought people to the BFI and educated them about Gothic cinema. And uh, yes, yeah, so it's a little collection of a collection of kind of little mini documentaries. The, the, the Roger Corman one is superb. <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> it was so incredible to me. Yeah. Oh, uh, is he still alive? He is. I mean, he's in his he's in his mid to late nineties. He's still going though. I must give him a call. <laughs> you should. He's he's a. Re- I mean, what you're saying earlier. He's a real. Um, he's an interesting interview. It was lovely to meet him, but he he definitely is someone who chooses his words carefully and it was interesting interviewing him because you'd ask him a question and he would stop and he would spend you could see him spend up to a minute in his head and then he would give you a very eloquent very kind of formulated answer but just to be around him was stunning that I mean he was he was incredible I got to do um I'm trying to think what else I did in that season. I got to do a... You got Argento in there too, right? <laughs> I got Argento. That looked, a bit was... of a, that looked a bit of a rough one. That was so hard. He didn't, he didn't want a translator. And like, he can speak... <laughs> he can speak English. Like, he understands English personally perfectly and he can speak English. But he's less eloquent in English. Yeah. And um, I think we had to subtitle that one in the end, I think. Um... It, again, it was one of those things where it was a pleasure to be in a room with him. My favourite thing about that was that when I got there, we'd hired this hotel and um, he felt he was too hot. He wanted the air conditioning on and he just couldn't get it working. And I was trying to get it working. He was trying to get it working. And there was definitely a moment where I was like, I'm fucking about with the air conditioning with Dario Argento. This is like a really strange You can't buy stories but... like that, can you? No. But that was also, you know, that interview was like a seat of the pants. One. That, I mean, I'll tell you that it's not very professional, but like um, I, when I was a kid, I used to really like horror, but I really struggle with it now. Like I really struggle with it. I, I, yeah. I don't like, um, I don't like violence. I don't like cruelty. And, and yeah, I really struggle with horror. And, and, I am committed, or I was committed while I was doing that job, to to being fully researched on everything I did. And I had tried to, I'd never seen an Argento film. I had tried to watch Suspiria, like, maybe a few years before. And the opening was so intense for me that I was just like, I can't, I can't watch this film. And um, I thought, well, 
tough. You're interviewing Argento. You're going to have to sit down. You're going to have to watch some of his films. So I got a pile of DVDs. I sat at my desk in the I stuck to Spirit on the five minutes in. I was like, I can't fucking watch this. It's horrible. Just watch the trailer. <laughs> so I just read everything on Wikipedia. I just went on Wikipedia <laughs> and read like the, the full kind of like breakdowns of every plot. Uh, that was a shame. I, I, winged, I winged that one. How do, how, I got do you, to, how do you fall out of love with horror? I mean, I had I had 20 years where I never watched anything and maybe recently I've kind of come back to uh, appreciate it. Like I, what, last night I watched The Babadook, which I've never seen film. before. Amazing film. Brilliant film. And I think I avoided it because the hype was so big. Yeah. I thought I'm just going to hate this because the hype is too much. So many years later, well, there's like, what, four people in it? Such a good film. Saying something as well. I mean, the Babadook was all about, you know, kind of it was about like motherhood and being a single parent. And that's I mean, that's where where I like horror. I mean, I like I I can still watch kind of films about ghosts. I like things which are about sadness and things which are about um I can watch something like that because that that film is not it's not a violent film, you know, that's that's emotional and it's different. I how can you fall out of love with horror? I think the answer is that when I was a teenager and I watched a lot of horror films, uh, to begin with, it's pushing the envelope and you're kind of, at that age, you're just excited to kind of see contraband and you're kind of excited to kind of, you know, it felt so fantastical. And, And then for me, as I got a bit older, into my 20s, my late 20s, and then people I knew started getting ill and dying. And I viewed life in a very different way. Okay. And I yeah. also viewed people in a very different way. Yeah, yeah. And and the funny thing is, like, the thing... So, as you said, I used to own a video shop. And that I've worked in video shops from from when I was 18 until my kind of... Until my early 30s. And this happened kind of... Like, this change happened while I was working in video shops. And I've got this theory. I mean, it's just personal. I don't want to judge anybody else. But, like... um. Slasher films are so great to watch when you're a teenager because every single person who frustrates or is the bane of your life gets killed in a slasher film. You watch a slasher movie and they kill the jocks and they kill the beauty queens and they they kill the terrible nerds and they kill their parents and they kill the horrible teachers and stuff. And um and it's really kind of it just feels like a great release and you can just and it's creative and it's funny the way they're killed and like just feels brilliant to watch. And then by the time I was in my kind of mid twenties, there was nothing funny about teenagers being murdered to me and I couldn't watch that and laugh at that because in my head I'm going well they're just fucking teenagers right of course they behave like ourselves that's what teenagers do and also real teenagers are getting killed in the world you know and it's and there are families out there who have lost teenagers you know who and there are serial killers who are actually killing teenagers and it just uh, it I hit an age where or a point in my development where I, it, I couldn't watch it I couldn't find it funny and I think I had this very weird time. It was This was actually where I was still a stu- student, but I saw The Frighteners in the cinema. And I remember there was just a really violent moment in it where the audience That's the laughed. Michael J. Fox movie, right? Yeah, it's Peter yeah. Jackson. Yeah. And um, the audience laughed. There, there was like, I mean, I don't really remember the film very well, but there was a killer who was like carving numbers into foreheads or something. I just can't remember what it was. But I just remember the feeling that the audience was laughing and I didn't find it funny. And then from then on, it really, it really kind of there was this huge divergence to me from horror films, and I and I still feel that way. And and when I was working video shops, and I was seeing men in their kind of forties and fifties renting films where teenagers were slaughtered, I it, it, it just I yeah, it just didn't appeal to me, and, and I'm not, still like that. It's not really a thing anymore, is it? The slasher flick. No, it seems to have gone away a bit. It's the, it kind of it went through a very kind of self-conscious period after Scream where everything was a bit meta. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, it doesn't seem like it. It's certainly not not to the degree it was in, in the kind of 80s where it was just everything. I think some of the more modern ones, like um, I don't watch an awful lot, but things like Insidious and Annabelle, they're, they're a different kind of horror. They're, they're very yeah. well done and very clever. And the horror sticks to the paranormal. Absolutely. Which is, which is my 
favoured kind of thing. I was never a big slasher flick guy. But um, I used to own a video I saw Insidious. Shop. Did you own a video show? I did. Well, tell um, me about the video show. From about 90, it was a short period, 90, 92 to early 95, I was living in the Wirral. Right. There. And my, my, my wish was for it to be the, the greatest video shop in, well, not in the land, but in striking distance for people who needed video. So um, it, it was good. We used to, it was the 90s. You could get away with anything. We used to, um, we used to club together and buy um, band video nasties from, from the classified ads in Loot. Right. <laughs> We'd import them from Texas uh, or, you know, where, wherever they were so that, people could actually watch the Texas Chainsaw Massacre or Drill Up and things like that. Because you just couldn't, it was that huge period, you just couldn't even get hold of these movies. And when you did finally watch them, you were kind of like, that's a bit rubbish, you know? Oh, Zombie Holocaust whole- was like, uh, I Spit On Your Grave was dull, uh, you know, they should have been banned for being a bit rubbish, really. But um, I think I think a lot of them were banned based on their titles. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. You know, I really yeah. think I think I think a lot and a good I mean, cover. Exactly, I think a lot of that. It was very reactionary that whole that whole but, period. Um, yeah, well, one of the one of the. I mean, it, it was weird. I had a band at the time, and and the video shop was kind of like a cover <laughs> 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 to make some money. But we we had we had great fun in there. You know, people would come in, they value your opinion. You, you must have found exactly the same. Gotcha. Um, it was, but it's weird. I I miss owning a video shop in a weird way, but I don't miss the video shop. I don't. I don't miss what it became when it when it became just blockbuster everywhere. And that was awful. But there was there was a. I didn't. I didn't have the best video shop in the area. There was a guy maybe twenty miles away, who must have had a video shop since the day day one when video shops were ever invented and he had kept everything God. and it, it was like one of those um one of those hoarding shows that you see on the tv there was no oh, God, reason tiny shops which is just yeah. full kind of like yeah, yeah, yeah they were yeah. stacked up you could get you know picnic at hanging rock like it was probably on tv every 10 minutes but he had a vhs <laughs> of it you know and you go oh, i'll get that it was, it was very odd but um it was a thing. It was a thing of pe- people our age. It was a thing of our youth for sure. Yeah. Yeah. The best thing yeah. that ever happened to me was um, when I was a, uh, 87, um, I was about 20. The guy in the local video shop let me buy the cardboard cutout of Pinhead. Amazing. Hellraiser for a tenner. <laughs> I, I had that for years, but you know, those things are missing now. Yeah. All yeah. That, I mean, God, I, you know, I struggle with it a lot because I'm a video shop guy and, you know, I'm always going to be a video shop guy. And, and I, I feel very bad for my wife for what that brings along with it, which is, you know, at this point, a collection of about 4,000 DVDs and Blu-rays, which kind of have to go somewhere. No VHS? <laughs> no. Do you know when I shut oh. down the shops? So I had a big personal collection of VHS, which, which was what I started the first shop with. Yeah. And when I shut the shops down, I was just like, look, realistically, you know, what am I going to do with this? So I, I, we, we actually, it's regretful now that VHS is rising in value, but we, we sold all the VHS as a job lot. Yeah. And I took out of the shop basically all the DVDs I wanted, you know, like I just, you know, that was like my payment. Because, yeah. you know, I made, you know, well, you know, it's like you make a basic living as, <laughs> if you're in a video shop, it's not, you don't make yeah. a lot of money out of it. Um, no, I kept some VHS. I mean, I've probably got probably got about twenty VHS. I liked the old Warner Brothers, the original big box rentals with the black Warner Brothers kind of cover. So I, I kept all of those because I'd collected those before I opened the shop. But then when I wrote a book about video shops called Video Socratic, and when I I did that as a Kickstarter campaign to fund to fund the, the uh, publishing of it, and one of the kind of rewards was you get one of my original VHSs, you know, as part of the package. So and you could choose which one. So most of the best ones went out, went out with that campaign. But they went to good homes and that felt really nice, you know. 
It's a strange existence, isn't it? I mean, once you'd seen Clerks, that was your life in a nutshell, and it was very <laughs> sad. <gasps> yeah, it was lovely, though. I mean, I, I struggle now because, because I love films, and I do not... What's happened now with the death of video shops and with the partial death of physical media and with the onslaught of streaming platforms is that films aren't special anymore. They don't feel special. It used to be that, that TV was whatever, TV, it's on, stick it on, who cares? But to go to the cinema felt special and to rent a video felt special. And renting a video, there was, there was a form of ceremony to it which was that you would pay for it, you would go and choose it, you'd spend a while choosing the right one, you'd bring it home, you'd turn your phone off, you'd turn the lights off, you'd maybe have a curry, and even if it was not a particularly good film, you'd paid your £3.50 and you watched it the whole way through, you know, yeah. had your full attention. And that doesn't happen now. With streaming, it's taught us... It's, firstly, streaming has made film and TV kind of on a par in terms of specialness because you could just watch whatever you want, whenever you want to watch it. And because it's all free and because there's so much of it, you don't mind turning off after 10 minutes. It never has your full attention. And it's just it's just not the same. And for me personally, the thing that drives me nuts is I can't navigate my way through the streaming platforms. I just, I don't like how they organise them. I don't like how they recommend things for me. I just want to see, a, either I want to see it alphabetical or chronological. I just want to go, here's the newest stuff in order that it has come on the platform. And I'll just scroll through it that way. And, and it won't, won't let me do that. And still to this day, I just prefer to stand in front of a wall of fucking DVDs or Blu-rays and look at all the spines and pull them well, out and kind of, you know. That's that's the flaw in the algorithm, isn't it? Because if you if you go into a video shop, you're, you ju- you're just looking. Yeah. And, and exactly the same with books. When you when if you've bought something on Amazon, you try you flog you more stuff that's similar or by the same guy, which you've inevitably read or watched at some point, yeah. and it it never shows you new things. So it doesn't it doesn't but, and it it can't because like most of us are pretty nuanced people, you know. But there should be so a button that, that says work. there should be a button that says show me all the stuff that I've never looked at. That would be sick, yeah right. Absolutely. I mean, it's I, it, for me, it's really counterintuitive. But now we've, I think for most people, they've got used to it and we've got a new generation. That's all they've had. Um, you know, video shops aren't coming back. <laughs> so, <Nope. laughs> although I, there was, there was a story, wasn't there? And maybe six months ago about a guy in Liverpool who'd opened a video shop. Did you catch that? Really? I don't know. It happens from time to time, and there there are some of the old ones still about. I know Dave Wayne on Twitter. He's he's still got his. I think that's up in Liverpool, in fact. Oh, maybe it's him. Um, I don't know. He, he's been going for a while, but they do well. You know what it is 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 that collecting VHS is now like a retro pursuit. You know, and you've got a lot of young guys who kind of you know VHS to them is one of their earliest memories. And they're building up these huge collections because you can see them all on, on Insta and Twitter and stuff. Yeah. Um, and I think some of them are, are kind of opening. There was a lovely chap, I can't remember his name. This is going back about 10 years. But he used to, um, he had a brilliant business because he basically rented fa- a fake video shop. He would come to your corporate event or whatever and set up a 1980s video shop. And <laughs> I went to the launch of, they did that, there was a horror film called VHS like a, a kind of a, what do you call it, like three films in one. Yeah. And they did a launch for it in London. He set up his video shop as, you know, you watched it in a real 1980s video shop and that was lovely. But from, from a film point of view, which is exactly where you are, I mean, it's given, it's given you a career. Yeah. I, I guess if you notch up a little bit, you go to Kevin Smith and um, that Tarantino guy. Yeah. The, the, I th- do you think that I don't know where film students with that sort of edu because it's an education. It is. An I education. don't know where film students would get that sort of an education now that that's gone. Well, do you know the great irony of that is that right now when we were kids, it was hard to find a lot of these films, mm. you know, and 
you know, part of my education was movie drone on TV, you know, where, where Alex Cox would introduce two films and just blow your mind every kind of once a week. And the irony of this is that right now, every film ever made is basically completely available, but there's no curation. There's no one teaching really kind of like people, kids, kind of younger people coming into it. I mean, I did a project with a BFI where we were trying to connect with YouTube influencers, you know, a horrible term. And, you know, I spent some time with a couple of, a couple of these guys, one of who's now like a big radio one DJ and stuff. And these guys were earning so much more money than either of us will ever see in their lifetimes because they had these successful YouTube channels and they were based around film, but they really didn't know shit about film history, you know, at all. And they were kind of key. They were nice guys and they were kind of keen to learn. But you just go, holy shit, you guys are being held up as the film experts of your generation and you haven't seen the basics. You know, the, the very basics you've not seen. And um, I found that kind of shocking. So in a way, it's good that everything is out there and available. But I also think that kind of, I worry about curation. I worry about everything fractures as well. There's no kind of like... There's no central place. It's like movie dramas on BBC Two. So, you know, the whole country, if you were interested in films, you would watch movie drama. But now there's no kind of central place for people to go to. So I, I feel that it's kind of become a lot more fractured and a lot more kind of genre-based as well. I don't think there's many people who, who are kind of like fluent in, in, in cinema history as a whole. There's a lot of horror. For, you know, horror is completely dominant, you know. Um, and there's sci-fi... And but there's not that middle ground. This is this happened yesterday. This is really interesting, actually. I was listening to do you know Brett Goldstein's podcast, Films to Be yeah, Carried? With? Yes. So I love that. I, I really love that. And I think he's fucking brilliant. And he had a guest on who the the question was, you know, what film made you cry? And he said Mr. Holland's opus. And they talked about Mr. Holland's opus for a good 10 minutes. And I was just like, fuck, I've not seen that film in years. Like, I love that film, you know. I love yeah. Richard Dreyfus, so I love that film. And I've got it, all of my DVDs are in the attic right now. We're living in a tiny little house. All the DVDs are boxed away in the attic. And I can't get to them. So I was just like, fuck it, I'll just, you know, it'll be on one of the streamers. And I spent half an hour, and it, was on, it wasn't on any streamers. It wasn't on, you could download it as a digital and you couldn't download it from, from, from iTunes. You couldn't see it on any channel. The DVD is out of print and it's never been on Blu-ray. And I, I could not believe it. Because that was a big film, Mr. Holland's Opus. You know, yeah, that was not huge an obscure film. So, you know, you go, well, where the fuck is that? So I, I, I went on Twitter and I put, I, I made a, a tweet about it. And I said, you know, what's going on? And James, my friend James Flower, who works for Arrow, he's one of the producers at Arrow DVD. He said, this is exactly what's happened. He said that, like, if it's not a genre film, Disney in particular is just sitting on loads of these films. They're not letting anyone release them. He said also, if it's the kind of film which was funded as a co-production around different countries, so different right, rights holders in different countries, he said those films are just disappearing. Those middle, he said you can't see Three Men and a Baby now. There's no way to watch Three Men and a Baby. Really? No way to watch it. <laughs> It's just not available. That's crazy. That's what, I mean, that's what he, that's what he said. Um, but yeah, it blew my mind. It really blew my mind. Just go, what the fuck? How, how has that happened? Really scary. But that's, you know, that's the point. Of the and you were thinking so, a world where everything, you assume, people say, like me, and yeah. I say it all the time, everything is available everywhere. But to think that th three men and a baby was missing or Mr. Holland is quite bizarre. It's crazy. And it's also, it, and it, it's, it's easy. I mean, you know, I've actually been saying that, that everything's available. And it's not true. It's not true at all. And there's, um, I was reading an article about Scarecrow Video, which is this huge old video shop in Seattle, which is basically the biggest video shop in the world, which has now become a, a, a cooperative. So it's completely publicly owned. Right. And um, they, the woman who runs that was saying that if you, add up all of the films on Netflix and Amazon and the big streamers, it comes to about 60,000 films total. And if you've ever looked, if you've ever scrolled long enough through Amazon Prime, you know that 40% of those films are dog shit. Yeah. You know, they're not even films, you know. Yeah. Um, she said there's about 60,000 films in total. In Scarecrow Video, they've got 140,000 films on site. So we're losing films. 
we're actually losing films. And that's quite scary. Yeah. And no one can own them anymore. You know, the, the physical media is dying and it's getting to the point where people can't own films. It's really scary. Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. What was the last film you cried at? I cry at every single fucking film I watch. Um, what was the last film I cried at? I, I cried at... Um... I cried at the episode of Doctor Who where David Tennant left Rose on the beach. I found that. Oh, one. my God. Um, yeah. And the last film I cried at was A Monster Calls, I think. Oh, my God. That film destroyed me. That's a which, beautiful which film. Which gave me a good kicking at the cinema. <laughs> <laughs> the, the worst one. The worst one was um, we went to, when I had the video shop, we went to a preview screen in a, a cinema in Liverpool of Legends of the Fall. I've never actually seen that. And I think right in the last sort of 60 seconds, uh, Brad Pitt gets killed by a bear. Oh, no. It's very sad and very emotional. But it kind of happened, and then the house lights came up. And it was just full of mostly men, everyone with their oh, oh, lights up, heads down, you know, that sort of... <laughs> That's a good film. Actually. Really good film. But I should... That's, you know, that's, that's one of those films where it's weird that I've missed that. I, there's a film for me that, that I find very cathartic, which is called My Life. It's a Michael Keaton film from the early 90s. I recall. That's the one where he's got HIV, right? It's cancer. cancer. It's cancer, yeah, but he's, he's dying of cancer. And um, takes, that makes me cry the whole way through. It. Exactly that. His father shaves him. Yeah. And, and he's dying and his father shaves him. And he goes, how are you doing? And he goes, I'm not having the best week, Dad. And he just <laughs> fucking collapse with tears. But I cry at anything. I've, I've, I've got a huge, um, huge empathy problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. Just get right in there. I don't mind it, though. You know, I'm part of, we're both past the age where we give a shit about what other people think about us. So it's completely fine. And it's only my wife that really sees it. She just rolls her eyes. <laughs> it's all right. I tell you what is weird, and I'd never heard of this till I dug through your website, the pre-code cinema thing. Yeah. With all those rules... I, I, oh, I, didn't yeah. even, I never knew that was a thing. Can you just yeah. give the listeners a bit of a... That was just a crazy time. One. It was a cr- crazy time in kind of American film history where the... Oh, God, I'm trying to have to... It's so buried in my past. I have to kind of go deep to try and remember it exactly. But essentially, pre-code is now, is now recognised as a genre. And what it was was that before... I'm going to get the dates wrong. It's the 50s. Yes, yeah, um, it's, a, it's sometime in the 50s, basically when America became kind of puritanical again. And they blamed Hollywood cinema for, like they blamed the comic books in the 60s for yeah. kind of, you know, for kind of corrupting the youth and stuff. And you had studios like Warner Brothers who really had, had were making all of their money on kind of gangster films and that kind of thing. And what happened was they brought in a guy... Hayes, it was called the Hayes Code. That's the code they they refer to. And this guy Hayes basically drew up a moralistic list of things that you could not do in feature films. And it was um and they were it was ludicrous stuff. It was like yeah, to, I read it. <laughs> yeah it's like to like in terms of sex, no character could a character had to have one foot on the floor at all times, you know, like if they were on a bed. And um and it was there, you know, and it was, it was trying to get rid of violence. It was trying to get rid of kind of, um, to a degree, it was trying to get rid of almost kind of communist kind of thinking and stuff. And it's interesting because the pre-code era was pretty wild, and people don't think of that that era of that that era as being wild. So the films that are recognised as pre-code are the ones which broke the code before the code kind of came in. It also took about two years for the code to come in. And in that time, the film, the film studios went as hog wild with it. You know? Yeah, some of the clips you show in that, um, in that little Vimeo video is are crazy. Like, yeah. Let's throw everything at this. A dinner party yeah. turned into some kind of drunken orgy just, just to stick it to the man. Totally. It was really interesting cinema. Like, you know, you can get... Um, you get pre-code, I think, I think it's called Forbidden Hollywood. There's a series of, of, of Blu-ray or DVD box sets which just deal with the pre-code era. Um, but yeah, it was nuts. Um, but it didn't even, I mean, the code didn't last long. And the funniest thing about the code was that, in a way, it became a challenge to the filmmakers to break the code without 
without the guys realizing that the code had been broken. And the reason the code held up for the few years that it did was because they kind of brought in this kind of Christian family organization who were kind of like, we will boycott your theatre chains if you don't do this. Right. But the studios realised really quickly that they weren't making money from Christian families. Yeah. So, you know, it kind of, it all tumbled down eventually, but it was, yeah, it's a really interesting kind of era. And then but, the 70s happened in filmmaking and everything went out the window very quickly, right? Totally. Well, the 60s, I mean, the 60s was, was when it really kind of burnt down. I mean, you know, it's almost a cliche now, but Easy Rider, you know, challenge. Of course, yeah absolutely everything and that was the kind of that was the the base that modern cinema was almost kind of built on you know 70s was different because the 70s was so much more intelligent i mean like the 60s was kind of wild and raucous and kind of testing boundaries 70s was just the best era of cinema in the world you know you had really intelligent people making really engaging films um and that all went in the 80s (laughs) i'm I'm no I'm no film historian, but even I can see that by the time you got to the 70s, the world had become a smaller place. So so you got those Argento films coming across. There was the distribution was better. You know, you could see you could start to see Japanese movies and they made some crazy horror flicks. Absolutely. Um, The world became very small and um, the, the influence that it pulled in from being well distributed. Um, I think served us well going forwards, very well. Definitely, definitely. And it was, you know, also we live at a time now where there's there's way too much content. And back in the seventies, you know, it was there. They were because because there were only how, however many channels on TV, and there were only so many slots at a cinema. It kind of meant that you know it had to to get there. It had to be of a certain quality, um, and everyone was aware of it. You know. We, we definitely live in a time now where everything's so fractured that there's no, you know, the, the, the notion of a mainstream is disappearing very quickly. Because if you think about the 60s... Like an old person. Well, you know, I, I don't. I don't, because that's fine. You know, like, it's, you know, you don't have to be anachronistic with it. You, you know, it's, it's okay to kind of say, this seems like it was better in our time, and, you know, maybe other things are better now. Well, you know, I mean, maybe fracturing is better. I mean, who knows? Like, you know, maybe maybe by fracturing, actually, and by the, the, the kind of proliferation of content, maybe it means there's more stuff for the for the for each small fractured piece to get into, you know? I think it's a shame because I think it's nice to have a rounded... I feel growing up that with only four channels on TV, you had to watch what was on. Yeah. You couldn't watch what you wanted when you wanted. And because of that, you know, I ended up watching, you know, The World at War and kind of crazy shit that Channel 4 was showing kind of late at night because there was nothing else on. And I think that broadens your horizons. I don't think it's good for people to only consume what they like when they when they want to, necessarily. That, that you know. is exactly the world we're living in. It is, it is. Um, that, we live in a stupid world. <laughs> that, that echo chamber thing, we, we, you, only yeah. get, you only get what you like and what you agree with. But I think watching junk on TV when we were kids was priceless, probably. I mean, we, we used to sit down in front of the top of, top of the Pops every week. I'd probably sit there for nine months before Twisted Sister turned up. Absolutely. I sat through but Bum- you were aware of everything Pops else. And but and that's and that's also you know it's no bad thing. I mean that you know that that totally opens you up to kind of other other forms of music and other kind of things. Um, yeah, I yeah I I you know it's the kind of thing that I that I worry about. I've got a young daughter, and it's she's a bit too young to really understand what's going on with TV and stuff. But I'm really scared about 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 that about what she's going to get. I mean, you know, in this country, like. I mean, I'm going to sound like a real old kind of anachronistic codger, but like BBC, the BBC and Channel 4, which were three of the channels that we had, were run by people who were qualified to run it. The people at the top at that time were people who had started off as T-boys and had worked their way. They had mostly been filmmakers at certain points. Then they'd been heads of the department and then they were heads of, of, of the channel. You know, they were people who who, who not only understood the process of of making quality programs, but they also understood, they they had kind of quite, you know, um, 
varied lives. They'd, they'd lived their lives, you know, and um, and that doesn't happen now. And and by having those channels run by people who were almost responsible, intelligent people who had a good idea about who who almost had a civic thing. You know, when the BBC started with Lord Reith, who might have been a monster for all I know, but the whole point of BBC was to entertain and to inform. That was their their creed, you know, and that's all gone because all TV is commercial now, including the BBC, which which has to be commercial to, to keep up. And that's bad. <laughs> we don't have people who, who, are, who are deciding what we and our children are watching on the basis of, like, some kind of civic duty they're deciding on the basis of of, um, of commerciality. And I know that because I'm working in that industry now. Yeah. I know the, the, the things that are imposed upon me and the things which influence the kind of content I'm going to make. And that can be a very hard battle. It can be really hard to kind of try and, try and retain quality and focus and point when you're dealing with people who are only thinking about, about money and about audience figures and stuff. And that's scary, you know, and, and this is also, this has happened in news media, which is even scarier, you know, like, you know, the people who are feeding, that's why so many people are dying, especially in America right now, is because they're getting their information from somewhere which doesn't give a shit if they live or die or give them the truth. All they care about is, is kind of money and, and yeah. kind of politics. It's a really scary time to be alive right now. Yeah, I think I think the last person of that old guard is probably David Attenborough, right? And that probably Absolutely. that probably shows in the work that he still does, which is still um, and he's, like it was. Well, you know, it, <laughs> it is, but it's also like you know, like it's also like pushing the 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 uh, the envelope on technology. I mean, like you know, his shows they That's they're right. always something new, always something new. And one of my friends is is an editor and a director of his shows, and you know, like they are they 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 are at the cutting edge of kind of wildlife documentary always, and it's stunning that David Attenborough is still doing this. You mm. know, like I interviewed him once, and and he's a, an incredible person, and he's in his nineties, you know, and he is still he's still able to front, you know, to to front and produce these documentaries. It's stunning, brilliant. Um, wrapping it up then what's next for you anything good <laughs> uh, lunch lunch <laughs> I don't know I mean to be honest there's there's basically three projects which are all kind of vying for my attention right now and we're going to find out kind of what it is there's there's the next feature film that I really want to make um, I've just just bought the life rights off this guy who nobody has ever heard of and I can't wait to introduce the world to him. Uh, I can't. I can't give much away. But it's a very. It's a story from the nineteen about someone who did something very incredible in the nineteen eighties, which was not very well documented, um, and has great. What he did has a lot to say about where society is now. So he's in his seventies now. Um, and that's that's hopefully going to be my next feature film. That's I've, I've kind of started work on that, and um, and then we're hopefully we're hopefully we're doing another documentary um, for BritBox, like um, like Hollywood Bulldogs, where where there's a film based a film based uh, documentary which which is kind of in the works now, and we're waiting to we're waiting to get the final sign off on commission for that, and that'll probably be the next physical thing that we actually do. Brilliant. No, no sign of a Will Hay documentary in there for me. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Do you know, like, I, I really, um, I really feel um, right now the kind of the call to to stay British and to concentrate on the British film industry. There's, you know, there's there's plenty of people out in the states, kind of like, and American film history is better documented. It's far better documented. Mm. So I really, I really want to do stuff about the British film industry. And and there's a, you know, that generation is that that I'm most interested in are starting to die off now. And so I really feel like I want to get as much, as much kind of stuff in the can as I can right now um, to get it from the horse's mouths. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. The British film industry is not, you know, I worked for BFI for a whole chunk of time and they do their best to kind of educate people about it. But, 
doesn't get talked about a lot and it's so interesting the history of British film is so interesting um, so there's lots of stories waiting for me to tell them <laughs> brilliant listen um, thanks for your time it's been great thanks so much it's been lovely talking to you and to meet a, a fellow video shop guy is we'll the best <laughs> I'd love that I would absolutely love that Sean yeah brilliant okay awesome take care see you later bye bye bye, bye.